Hello, everyone. I'm astonished how many people are still here at 3 o'clock on the last day. Um, I'm coming to you not as part of a team, just a single person. Uh, being very old school literature, I am going to partly read, but hopefully in ways that will still be fun. Uh, and um, as our introducer said, I'm here to talk about the uneven digitization of historical literature, looking at a specific case study of just a, a short 11-year period in the late 18th century uh, that I am particularly interested in. So, literary history, as it is studied and taught, is shaped by its infrastructure, especially the infrastructure that makes texts available to be read, uh, as I think we saw with this idea that we're studying based on what's in anthologies. Uh, the findings we're able to make depend in a large part on what we're able to access to draw conclusions from. Today, digital archives of historical materials are a crucial infrastructure for research. In the early days of mass digitization, a techno-utopian emphasis on scale sometimes promised an escape from fraught problems of textual selection or even an escape from canons themselves. Of course, digital scholars have increasingly shown how completeness is always a fantasy, even when digital infrastructures and tools dramatically expand the scope of what we are able to work with. And uh, particularly when working with 18th century books, which are quite old and have gone through centuries of uh, historic selection processes at each stage of survival, collection, cataloging, preservation, and digitization, it would actually be a surprising discovery to find that the available digital surrogates are perfectly statistically representative of the period's original print production. Making an archive larger does not guarantee that various absences will average out, and the important question therefore arises, and this is the one that I'm interested in exploring a little bit today, uh, what is it that's not digitized? So here I'm gonna take up that question as it might impact my specific area of 18th century studies by measuring the uneven digitization of works in four different databases that ought to all be the same as each other because they are all representing the same time and place. Uh, for works published in England specifically between 1789 and 1799, which is an 11 year decade that I chose because Early on, I wanted to think about how um, revolution in France impacted English literature, uh, but I started with these much more basic epistemological questions of how could I know what I know about, and this is where I ended up. Uh, so I want to start by orienting us to these four databases uh, because uh, <laughs> as I encounter when I talk to my friends, not everyone is intimately uh, familiar with the differences between ECHO and ECHO TCP. Um, so our largest circle here is uh, the, the object about which we would like to actually know things. All works printed in England, 1789 to 99. And the largest sort of subset of digital surrogates through which we might attempt to learn about this historic whole is the ESTC, the English Short Title Catalog, which contains bibliographic records of sort of author, title, publication year, current holding libraries, that sort of information for, in this 11 year period, 51,091 titles. Of those titles, uh, our next largest slice is the 18th century collections online uh, database, ECHO, which has uh, 26,848 of ECHO's items uh, presented as digital facsimiles, PDFs, of microfilms that were themselves made in the 1980s. Uh, it's this dependence on 1980s microfilms for Echo that has also motivated the gendered edge of some of my work to be very casual because I suspect there aren't actually British romanticists here. Uh, the 1980s is before British romanticists thought maybe women could matter. Uh, <laughs> and I was curious to see uh, if those sort of 1980s conceptions of literary priority were still affecting uh, digital surrogates available today because of that sort of chain of creation where the PDFs are tied to that original microfilming. Uh, 
So that's Echo, our uh, next blue circle. Very, very small is a further subset of Echo, the Echo TCP, which is the text creation partnerships corpus of TEI encoded, hand uh, proofed, beautiful, perfect for distant reading and computational work texts. You might not even be able to see it because of this original 51,000, they have 525. Um, and also sort of in parallel with all of this in pink is the Hathi Trust Corpus, which in many ways is a more perfect comparison point to Echo because like Echo, uh, those are PDF facsimiles of the full text, but not based on microfilms. Those are based off of uh, digital photography carried out in the 2000s. I, uh, the people here have probably heard of Hathi Trust, um, but uh, this again, theoretically the same books, but with a completely different path towards their existence as digital surrogates. Uh, and so therefore potentially, uh, well, spoilers, in fact, with uh, different kinds of works ultimately becoming available. So the, the question, as I've said, is do these collections of the same literature have the same proportion of women's writing? Uh, in order to answer that question, I had to go and determine for all of these works what were the genders of the authors associated with each title, a process of um, grappling with 18th century sort of authorship attribution that I found really fascinating and has brought me to tell you today what are the 10 genders that an author can have in the 18th century. You'll probably know these first two, male and female. Um, and it was, for the most part, quite straightforward to sort authors into these categories. Um, the vast majority of, I remembered that I wrote my talk in advance, um, the vast majority of works are attributed to authors with names that are strongly gendered in the 18th century. So John, William, and Thomas together account for 14% of the works in the English short title catalog. Some of you might be familiar with the Dave versity problem of uh, more books by Dave than by all women. Here we have way more books by John than by all women. Um, and as I worked my way through the long tail of names, any time I encountered a name that I wasn't as familiar with as I was with John, I was able to look up the specific person, so Tench Cox and Bealby Porteous, all kinds of really fascinating names um, I was able to identify. Um, confirming my initial expectation that first names are distributed by a very strict gender binary, I only found one name that was used by both a male author and a female author in this period. So Ellis Pugh was male, while Ellis Cornelia Knight was female. Uh, and the only transgender author that I know to have published in the 1790s is the Chevalier d'Eon, who is attributed as female in my sample because all of the works attributed to her uh, identify her as Mademoiselle or Chevalier. My French isn't good enough to convey to you that it has an E on the end, uh, but so they sort of fell within my parameters of a clearly identified female author. So that's male and female. The next two major categories that uh, I encountered as trying to grapple with what kind of gender might be attached to an author are unsigned works where there is no information whatsoever. Um, it's completely blank, the author field, uh, and works by organizations of some kind. So the Royal Navy, the Church of India, the East India Trading Company, um, quite a large number of uh, societies would publish things. And in fact, the ESTC distinguishes in their metadata between organization and person entities in a way that made those quite straightforward to identify. So, so far, so good. Um, the next two, so the, the remaining genders fall into two umbrella categories. The, uh, those that are initials and those that are some kind of moniker or descriptor or pseudonym. Um, thinking about initials first, uh, I ended up breaking these down into three categories based on whether um, the, in addition to the initials present, there was some kind of strong gender signal being provided that allowed you to sort of read between the lines. So, um, 
this is actually a great example for the way in which I've constructed my data to be not about the books themselves, but ba rather about the researcher's encounter with the database record. So William Henry Ireland uh, actually gets encoded with two different genders in two different records. In the ESTC, he's listed as WH Ireland, and then in parentheses, William Henry, which allows me to identify him in that context as initials male. Whereas in Hathi Trust, he's listed simply as WH Ireland, no further information. And I decided it didn't count that I just happened to know who WH Ireland is. Um, from purely the database record in and of itself, there isn't a gendered signal, and so that one I tabulated as ambiguous. Uh, similarly, I would draw, the other two things that I used to, to draw gendered conclusions here were titles like M.G. Lewis Esquire MP, uh, Member of Parliament. Both Esquire and MP are titles that only a man could have held in this period, and so I treated that also as a sort of intentional signal. Um, this was a fascinating deep dive into what are all the incredibly wide range of titles women could not hold in the 18th century. Um, and I also looked uh, slightly beyond the author field, but never leaving the database record itself to, for pronoun usage in the rest of the record. So um, Deacon H I've indicated here as one of my male initials because it was a textbook that said in the subtitle that it was prepared for the use of his own pupils. Uh, and so I felt that if you were wondering at the moment of encountering the database about gendered authorship, uh, that one is telling you a male author. Similar principles applied for my various monikers and descriptors, where um, quite a lot of them give you enough information to start drawing conclusions. Um, okay. In general, I sought to be very conservative with my assumptions about gender based on these contextual clues. Uh, so, um, I'm sorry, skipping down. Yeah, if it was at all possible for a moniker to refer either to a man or a woman, I rec recorded that one as ambiguous. Um, as an example here, I would say that um, Deacon H uh, is marked as ambiguous, even if it struck me as a little bit unusual for a woman to write a compendious treatise on the treatment of venereal disease, gleets, et cetera. Um, I didn't want to bring in those kinds of preconceptions. Uh, also for occupations that weren't like literally legally barred to one gender or other, I have a philanthropic butcher I indicated as ambiguous. Um, but many of them fall into much clearer categories like a lady, a gentleman, um, a, oh, I had a really fun one, like, oh, a Burgess, but no stupid rail man. Uh, <laughs> this, was, this was really the, my favorite part of this whole project. Um, so in the data visualizations that follow, I'll be compressing these 10 genders back down into a few smaller categories, fundamentally four, which is uh, the male category will include male initials and male monikers on that principle that at the moment that the book is getting typed into the database, there's some knowledge uh, indicating male authorship. Um, same for female, and then unsigned and organization. So, what did I find out? Um, the first thing I found was that these smaller, less comprehensive digital archives do dedicate a higher percentage of their space to male authors. Uh, and my sort of my implicit mechanism here was this idea that when you choose to photograph a book or when you choose to transcribe a book, there is a greater level of uh, investment cost required. And so there's some potential for selection pressure to be causing people to want to prioritize works of literature that are in some fashion more important, more useful, uh, more relevant. Um, and at first glance, this aspect of the chart really looks like um, what you would see in anthologies of the period and that kind of thing. However, um, oh, and I guess I do want to pause on the fact that it's also relevant to me that these numbers are different from each other, right? That um, the differences in author demographics do confirm this, uh, un this hypothesis that the underlying collection and selection practices of each of these individual digital resources 
have it impact and produce a different sample of that imagined whole of all print production. Um, it's especially interesting to me that Echo and Hathi Trust differ from each other by 7%, which is even though they are the most similar in uh, what they actually have. So anything that would have been, any factors that would have been related to whether something was too physically fragile to be photographed or whether it was inaccessible for photography, um, those wouldn't explain the differences between Echo and Hathi Trust. And similarly, any of the pressures that might have been something being just too annoying to transcribe. Having done some TEI encoding myself, I definitely feel like there are things I would rather encode and things I would rather not. Um, and so those factors would shape what ends up in ECHO TCP. But again, those same factors don't apply for the difference between ECHO and Hathi Trust. Um, however, it's not um, men increasing uh, sort of their role in each uh, database at the expense of women, or rather, this increase in men in each of the smaller and smaller resources is paralleled by an increase in women in each of these resources as well. Um, and here the part I want to pause on a little bit is that uh, the initial figure for women is so small, 3% um, in the English short title catalog. Uh, this is much smaller than what we see for women in uh, genre specific studies. Uh, when people have looked, so I actually went through and did some math on um, databases for new novels and new poetry. Uh, and for the same time period, 20% of new novels were attributed to women. And I think 18% of new poetry, uh, both much, much, much higher. Uh, and so part of what we're seeing here is I think a thing that's often known but not always acted on that most of what's published isn't new novels and new poetry, even though that's what literary scholars like to study. Um, and so as that suggests, the thing that we're missing, in fact, the thing that there is the strongest selection pressure against as decisions are being made about what to invest in for digitization is works that I've come to think of as authorless works. So things that are by organizations and things that are unsigned, especially those things by organizations, sort of especially the reports of like the Newcastle Dispensary for the Poor, um, or where there's a sense of, it takes work to become excited about them to a certain extent. Um, and not just sort of the internal emotional work of the researcher, one of the things I've found is it also takes logistical work. So actually, um, I had a research trip planned to Goldingham because you guys have the only extant copy of this like random scurvy advertisement, scurvy cure advertisement that I wanted to study as a result of this work, um, which is much harder than uh, many of the novels from the same period. So, with an awareness that I'm getting close to the end of time, I'm gonna sort of end with this, that this is sort of my, if we wanted to think in terms of predictive factors, I actually found that gender was usually not a strong factor. So of all of the male authored ESTC records and all of the female authored ESTC records, 66% in both cases ended up in ECHO and roughly 23% in both cases ended up in Hathi Trust. So any given book by a man or a woman on a shelf has for this particular time period a roughly equal chance of making it to the next stage of digitization, but authorless works has half that chance or less. Um, and so that's where I've actually seen, uh, this is what's getting left out. If my question at the beginning was what's not digitized, uh, it actually isn't women's writing, at least for this tiny 11 year sliver, people have seen for 19th century novels that women's writing is under digitized. But here we have perhaps a success story of those uh, feminist scholars who came into British romanticism and pointed out that women's writing does matter. Uh, or perhaps it has to do with other factors with how libraries collect their underlying works. Um, and thinking about my conclusion, um, I have written a whole bunch of things about the romantic conception of the author, but I think for this audience, um, what I want to conclude on here is thinking about the art of distant reading more broadly and how to approach uh, working with corpora of historical texts to pose questions that are gonna be uh, accurately knowable based off of what you have. Um, so, 
namely, my, my key uh, point here, and we can kind of contemplate this slightly refigured version of the numbers uh, as I sort of put this forth, is that the works available in digital facsimiles are not statistically representative of the works for which we have bibliographic records. Uh, and even the ESTC can only be taken as a baseline for works that are currently held in academic libraries rather than a comprehensive account of all the works originally produced. Uh, given that no perfect source can exist, both Echo and Hathi Trust might fall within that realm of good enough, uh, particularly for distant reading questions that uh, for which you're confident that these authorless works would not be relevant to what you're trying to find out. Um, and, but I would pose that uh, scholars should build into the method section of distant reading research an explicit testing of the repository's gaps before proceeding too far. Um, and I especially advocate for making explicit comparisons between at least two potential sources as part of that validating of the methodology early on. Uh, and one of my other strong findings is that you probably shouldn't use the ECHO TCP corpus for distant reading. Um, even though it's the only one that will give you words that are all of them words, as opposed to horrible OCR of 18th century texts, um, I'm just not persuaded that as itself it can be used as a source corpus. Rather, again, turning to that idea of um, Pre-validation, I think an approach that I've seen often work well is to begin with some pre-digital list of some kind, a bibliography, a circulating libraries list, um, and uh, evaluate how many of those works are available in digital facsimile before proceeding and attempt to correct, potentially combine multiple sources, or even maybe you can use this research to convince someone to give you money to scan the books that are missing uh, to have a more comprehensive and statistically sound source. Uh, and so I think that is my final takeaway thought. Thank you so much. Uh, ready for questions. <laughs>